Mars Girl. I'm Josh Knight the First. And welcome to episode 107 of Moko Replay, the only podcast dedicated solely to all things City Hunter. On today's podcast, we're going to cover season 2, episode 56 of City Hunter, titled Success Story in Shinjuku. The Neighbor is a Beautiful Dancer, Part 1. It's been a minute. Hello. It's been a while. Hi, everybody. Oops. Well, no, not oops. We it get busy. Oop. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, life happens. Life and, happens. Uh, and, and you don't intend to go, like, two or more weeks with... How many weeks has it been? It's it? been about two plus weeks. There plus about... weeks. So, three weeks? Sure. Mmm. We usually don't make that mistake. Well, usually, also, we try to give ourselves a break. Usually back in November, but all of our plans are thrown off anyway, because... One, we were already going to Japan, which we've talked to you guys about. And then on top of all of that, we had to take care of your birthday. Oh, we had to take care of it. You're saying well, it yes, like it was you... a la- laborious task that needed to be tolerated. But did you have fun? Well, yeah, you got me that nice city hunter shirt. And on top of that, we made that really cool discovery while in Little Tokyo where they've got this Bondi pop-up store, right? Like it's a gacha store. It's just for gacha pawn. Right. right. You know, and... those little machines you put like tokens into and you get the little capsule with little, you know, toys or keychains or what have you. If you're favorite series. No, we were specifically looking for stuff from Undead Unluck, because I'm the subtitle editor and the closed caption editor on Undead Unluck for the English localization, right? And when we were in Japan, we found a couple of these machines across Tokyo of different characters from Undead Unluck, and we're missing one of them. Like, the main character? It was very upsetting. Yeah, you're missing Andy Mm -hmm. out of that set. Yeah, the guy who is undead. That guy. Right, exactly. And so we figured we knew it was there down in little Tokyo. We that knew that pop the up capsule shop. store. Yeah. Because, you know, I've gotten stuff from there too back when they had stuff for like Shin Kamen Rider. Right. Which was pretty cool. I got a couple of things out of that. And we're like, okay, well, if we're already going to be down there. Why don't we go check it out and see if we can't find more of those Undead Unlock keychains for you? And lo and behold, when we get down there, what do we see in those machines but City Hunter Angel Dust Gachapon? Which is machines. so strange because when we were in Japan, City Hunter Angel Dust was still in theaters. We went and saw it in theaters, never saw City Hunter Angel Dust capsules anywhere in all of Tokyo. On top of that, we went to Gashapon specific locations where all they had was wall-to-wall Gashapon machines, and we didn't see that one at all. We didn't know it was even a thing, and yet here they are, out here in Los Angeles. Of all places. In Little Tokyo. At that hour. Yeah, at that specific moment in time. And you know what? We got probably some of the best ones out of that selection. Yeah, we got Saiko, we got Umibozu. And then the third one, because we only got three, was a combination Ryo and Kaori back-to-back with their guns out or whatever. Or yeah. no, she's got her hammer no, out. No, no, she's got her gun out. She's got her gun out. If okay. we had gotten the solo ones, she would have had her hammer. There, You can get a solo Ryo and a solo Kaori. You can also get Angie. She's the, the, the new the, character. The new character specifically for that movie. Or you could have gotten the three girls from Cat's Eye. Like, that could have been cool. That would have been still pretty cool. It been okay, but you know what we're here for specifically is the City Hunter cast, and Cat's Eye only really kind of started showing up in recent movies. And like, Since Shinjuku Private Eyes. Like, remember, we're technically part of the very distant canon. We're back here. We're in this thing somewhere. I mean, who knows? You can find Cat's Eye in the Lupin gotcha machine at some point. I mean, may- it, maybe it's you all can connected. Find, maybe you could find Lupin in a City Hunter gotcha one day. I you mean, know? you could Maybe now. you could find Tama from Tama and Friends in the Lupin City Hunter <laughs> Tama and Friends gotcha. <laughs> Witness the beginning of of a Mokori universe. (laughs) (laughs) Combined with Detective Conan, he's connected in there somewhere too. Kind of, yeah. Sort of, and Cat's Eye. You know, they're all there. Theme park coming 2025. But yeah, that's how we spent your birthday. You got some City Hunter stuff and you're happy about that. Yeah. And so to me, having spotted that Gachapon machine out there makes me feel more hopeful that we are going to get some kind of news about the American release in theaters of Angel Dust. You know what? I was just telling Josh this just yesterday. But while you were at work, all the anime, you know, the UK anime distribution company, right? Right. The the one I got confused for last time. I 
don't know what you're talking about. When we, last time we brought it up on the show, I got confused. Oh by yeah, their all name. the yeah, because their name is all the anime, and you just thought I was talking about every anime that has. Yeah, I thought you were talking about literally every anime ever, and it's like, oh, that's the name of the company. No, all the that's anime. a very misleading so company. They're the name. ones that distributed Angel Dust in theaters in France, right? So uh-huh. it's got its French distribution, and they said last year, oh, we've got City Hunter Angel Dust, and we're bringing it out in English, and that includes North America. You know, so- I'm just realizing now we completely forgot to look up how it did at the box office because it's it's open now. We'll see what happens. Anyway, I'm trying to tell you. So, like the other day, all the anime went live. Or, well, okay, live is not quite correct. They had a pre-recorded video that they put up onto YouTube, and they're kind of doing what Discotech likes to do, right? Where they've got a guy talking like, hey, here's all the stuff that we're going to be releasing in the next month. Here's all our Blu-rays. Okay, this is great. A couple of these are even coming to the U.S., so congratulations, America. And then they start talking about, we got stuff coming up in March. Not a lot of stuff we can talk about yet, but we'll talk about that next month. And that includes some stuff coming to cinemas you know be looking forward to that and that was like the closest that I heard about my the back of my head is like oh you're waiting until maybe March maybe March we'll hear something about the city hunter thing and then in the middle of the stream it's like 40 minutes into this video that they've put up and done a YouTube premiere for suddenly the video just disappears and I go back and I look at the link like it disappeared while I was in the middle of watching it (laughs) and I go back and look at this link and the owner of the YouTube channel has deleted the video. Like, they the just, link is dead, it's gone. They just deleted this video in the middle of this d- premiere on YouTube. And so, I didn't go back to look to see if they put up another version of the video. Maybe things are different now. Maybe they have fixed this. Some problem happened. <laughs> That's we not a good sign. We don't know. I don't know what happened. But eventually we'll figure it out. Yeah. And we'll let you guys know as soon as we get that information when you can go see Angel Dust in theaters. I mean, you guys might know before we get the chance to tell you because we only do a podcast once a week at best. On a good week. On a good week. And usually they're good weeks. We've had some bad weeks. I mean, they're not necessarily bad. We just get busy. Let's not do that anymore. I All right. I promise to never be busy ever again. I mean, don't make that kind of a promise, but... Well, then don't tell me to. I'm just saying, let's, let's just try. Let's try. Let's get through this episode. Fine. All right. So we're coming back to you guys with a new two-parter, and here at the beginning of the episode, we see a woman out and about in the streets of Shinjuku looking for an affordable apartment, and looking down these listings here on the side of a building, we see her going through some which, to my knowledge, are still very expensive even for the time period of 1989. She's looking at an apartment listing for about give or take about $850 in American money. Yeah, if we're talking about the 80s, that's that's pretty expensive, I guess. For 89? Yeah. Yeah, mind you, that's not the one that she ends up landing on. Like it, her it's, vision It's like for scrolls, comparison, yeah. Sure, and vi- her vision scrolls down and looks down at this other listing that's closer to like 150 bucks, which is just like holy shit. That is so cheap. Cheap. My first apartment in 2005 was like $450. I mean, that was cheap too. I mean, shoot, our like, rent when we were still living in San Antonio was only like $600. Right, exactly. Which is to say, you know, rent needs to be controlled and not be so outrageous anymore for everybody. But looking at this listing here that she's looking at, it's eight minutes away by foot from Shinjuku Station. It's in a four-story building. On the fourth floor. Rent is only 15,000 yen. That's what I'm saying, like 150 bucks at best. And even then adjusted for the dollar, it's less than that probably. Yeah. And it's a 24 mat room. And you had to explain to me what that meant. Well, yeah, because Japan doesn't measure their apartments and their floor space by feet or by meters or whatever. They measure by the length of tatami mats. Uh-huh. And tatami mats are a certain given, very specific, standardized size. The standardized dimensions. The standardized dimensions. And admittedly, I do not remember exactly off the top of my head what those dimensions are right now. But, you know, more tatami mats is more space. So this thing's got massive, this apartment has got massive floor space. It's got a full bath 
kitchen and it's only less than $150 US. Yeah, that seems really suspicious. I want to point out that like this scene of this woman looking at these apartment listings is not something that comes up in the manga. You just end up learning about how it is she got this apartment through the course of the manga, right? And that just leads me to talking about pulling from the manga. There's not a whole heck of a lot of differences between the manga chapters and what happens on screen here in the anime. But I thought it was kind of interesting to note that this episode takes place earlier in the manga than the episode that came before this. And we've talked about that before here on the podcast, that certain episodes are kind of done out of order from when they were introduced in the manga. Yeah, like this manga chapter that this is pulled from is something like 60 chapters earlier than the manga chapters that they pulled the last two episodes from. Right. It's crazy. They, they've just rearranged the production order of these episodes. But it does kind of just go to show you that when City Hunter is just doing normal ass cases or whatever, just taking normal jobs, you literally could just put them in whatever order you felt like. It, they don't really affect the greater overarching plot. Well... Maybe not so much on this one, but we'll come to that right, when we like, get there. Right, like, that's what I'm saying. M- most of the time, it doesn't tend to happen that way. There are some instances that must be placed in a certain order, and aside from that, you can just, like, rearrange this however you like. And so we go from looking at rental listings to late at night back over at Cowdy and Rio's apartment. Cowdy is asleep in her bed, sound asleep, when all of a sudden she hears sneaking in the room, and it's Rio trying to creep in, you know, tippy-toe, not make a lot of noise. Cowdy is woken up to this and realizes it's Rio and immediately gets like kind of flustered, but not angry flustered. She's like, oh no, he's actually sneaking in and it's into my room this time. He's actually trying to put moves on me now. I'm just going to lay here and I'm just not going to do anything. (laughs) (laughs) And so he sneaks closer and closer and closer until he goes past her. And further away, and further away, (laughs) until he gets to the other side of her where her window is, which is adjacent to the building across from them, which, we have to bring this up again, this building did not exist before this episode. No! Unless it's the same building that we're told Reika has her office in. Which... You know, I thought there was, like, a whole road in between, at least, right? But you remember in that episode, Ryo was able to get into Reika's office through a hole that he put in the basement. Sure. So I'm willing to assume it's the same building, if we're going to say that at all. That's fine, but but still, it's way too close. It it is really close. Like, there's barely enough room for a person to walk through just walking straight. But no, like, every time we have, like, looked at the building from a distant exterior shot, it had always looked like it was on its own plot of land with kind of a lot of space around it. Right, exactly. Unless literally every building that's on that same block is immediately behind it. That's the only way that works. Maybe Cowrie's room is against the back wall of the building and we never look at the building from the back. Maybe that's what it is. Maybe that's what it is, but also I think quite honestly, if we compare it to other episodes where we're shown Cowrie's room, they just change the layout out for this episode. Yeah, I think they just don't give a fuck, and if we're just doing this because, hey, this would be funny. Yeah, I I think that's what it is. I think that's what the answer is. And so Ryo sneaks out the window to go try and reach across to the other apartment because something over there is interesting to him, and Cowdy immediately gets pissed off. Of course she does. And Rio is just kind of like, oh crap, she caught me before I could get all the way across to this other building. And, uh, well now I'm falling to the ground. And as he hits the floor, Cowdy's remarking to herself, if you're gonna sneak into my room, the least you could do is do something. <laughs> like, how dare you come in here and do absolutely nothing? This is very upsetting. <laughs> the least you could do is try to bang me. <laughs> Because again, Cowdy is a little more honest with the audience, I guess now, Mm -hmm. that there's some feeling there between her and Ryo. She just won't say it to him directly. I mean, she's kind of saying it, but she's trying to like be mad about it so that it doesn't come across that she feels a way, I guess. I don't know. We're we're just not supposed to take her super seriously. But that whole train of thought is halted by her seeing something moving in the apartment directly across from her window. 
and she gets spooked because apparently there's some like rumor going around that that particular apartment room is haunted by zombies. Or ghosts. They ghost kind of go- zombies. Ghost zombies, They're yeah. They're ghost zombies. They're, they were dead, then they were undead, and then they were specters of the undead. Right. Yeah. You know, so Attack of Ghost Zombies, playing now on Tubi. <laughs> But I'm led to assume that Cowdy just decided to not get any more freaked out and tried to go back to bed. Because the action then goes to the next morning and we see the new tenant in that particular apartment. It was a woman by the name of Maiko Tsugihara. And it turns out that Maiko is trying to make her living as a professional dancer. She's already got an audience. It's an audience of little sparrows up in her window. Like, she must have the top floor of this building, I guess. And she's got the sunroof and the roof is kind of slanted. So it's this glass pane and the The skylight, the skylight, the birds looking in through the skylight window and she looks up at them and she's like, oh, I've been awoken by the birds. Oh, they're so cute. Uh, Now I'm going to dance for you. (laughs) (laughs) She just wakes up and she just starts dancing. She's just already in jazzercise clothes. Well, she switches into them very quickly. Well, no, she just rips off her sleep shirt and she's in jazzercise clothes. So she slept in like leg warmers and jazzercise tights and now she's dancing and she's doing like this song. Which specifically this song is off of the vocal collection from the City Hunter OSTs called Party Down by Momoko Kitashiro, which is in complete full English. It's great. Sounds great. I like this song. Yeah, very 80s party music for Japan at the time. For sure. And after doing a couple of like spins and ballet moves, she notices something else in the shadows above her coming from the skylight. And it's Ryo with his face pressed against the glass. You know, like a little kid. He, well, uh, and also uh, like a fucking weirdo. Yes, <laughs> yes. It's a little kid or a fucking weirdo. One of the two. If not both. Yeah. And she pulls a rope on the wall. Which just opens up the skylight, which I guess that's a thing you can do. So she's got three of these ropes. I assume another one of them would close the window. You would think. Right? But there is a third rope. And so she pulls the third rope once Rio hits the floor and just hits him with... With, I think it's 10 tons, 10 tons or yeah. something. A weight of 10 tons. And of course, why shouldn't she? It's a fucking weirdo who just fell through her skylight. And here's Rio, like, there on the floor. And it's funny that no sooner does he get hit by the weight that he gets up off the ground and he's already bandaged. Yeah, he somehow bandaged himself mid-injury. Pretty talented. And he's trying to explain to her, no, you don't understand. I'm not just a weirdo. I'm also your neighbor. I want I would be terrified. <laughs> you fucking kidding me? She's apologizing like, oh, I, I just thought you were trying to rob me. Not that you were my neighbor. You know your neighbors are capable of robbing you. Oh, like, absolutely, I don't, yeah. I don't understand. <laughs> just because you're my neighbor, that doesn't, I, that wouldn't stop me from dropping 10 tons on a fucking weirdo. But he tries to smooth it out and be like, hey, look, I think we got off on the wrong foot here. Can I invite you over for some morning tea? You want, you like tea? Would you like to do that? And to her credit, she's like, all right, I'll, I'll give you a shot. Fine, why not? And he's like, okay, well, let's take my shortcut. Which is up through the skylight and up a rope ladder. That he's got strung up from his building to hers. And she's like, we could just use the front door like not a fucking weirdo. And he's like, no, 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 this is the shortcut. And we could go an even shorter way. Uh, but there's somebody who might get really mad if we A took very it. dangerous person in the way if we go that way. Oh, really? A very dangerous person? Who might that be? Cowrie's over here with a knife? No! <laughs> I mean, he is using a rope ladder. That rope ladder is gone. Because Cowdy cuts the rope ladder as he's trying to cross it. So I guess they ended up going up through the front door after all. Yeah, I didn't actually think about that. That is what they ended up doing. They had to. I just want to point out, this is just the beginning of Ryo's antics. This is quite possibly some of the worst that Ryo has ever behaved in this entire series. Oh, he's pretty egregious this episode. It is really aggressive. It's insanely aggressive. And I understand it's played for comedy. He gets hit a lot, okay? He gets hit a whole lot. But man, he doesn't fucking stop. No, he is absolutely... 
absolutely living up to the title of horny on me. Yeah, yeah, it's a little bad. Now, thankfully, there wasn't too much more to deal with, and so they all just kind of agreed to have breakfast tea over at Cowdy and Rio's apartment. And as they're over there, Maiko has explained to them, oh yeah, I dance. I go to school during the day and I dance at night. And, you know, I'm going to classes and I'm trying to, you know, break into the industry. To which Cowdy's like, oh, that's great. That's so cool. To be quite honest, I was kind of spooked seeing you over there in that apartment last night. Because honestly, like we've heard a lot of stories about the ghost zombies over there. So we didn't know if you were a ghost zombie or not. Oh yeah, no, I'm not a ghost zombie. It's just that apartment is really cheap because of the ghost zombies. But on top of that, Cowdy has her own theory that actually we don't really think there's ghost zombies. I mean, I kind of believe in ghost zombies. But really what it probably is, is that every woman who moves in over there, they get peeped on by Rio and they think it's a ghost zombie. So it's kind of this cyclical thing. And even in that case, Michael responds to them, well, don't worry about that. I don't believe in that stuff anyway. Plus, I kind of have this protective little charm that I keep on me. And so she pulls out this charm that she's got, like, around her neck. Like, is it on a string? Yeah, yeah, yeah she's wearing it like, a, like a necklace. Yeah, so there's this tiny little doll. It's this this little girl. It just, it just looks like some little baby girl doll. It's barely, like, two inches tall or whatever. It looks like somebody knitted it or something. Yeah, like, it's very tightly packed and stuffed, probably. You know, round arms, round head, round legs, and whatever. Rio's like, oh really? What what is this? Some little doll thing? And she's like, yeah. So I carry this on me because when I got this, I had just participated in an audition. She passes the audition. She got gifted this doll, and it's just been this good luck charm ever since. And so she carries it on her all the time. So she's really not scared of like ghost zombies. But she does think something weird is happening around her. She just doesn't think it's ghost zombies. And Rio's like, well, what are you talking about? If you're not afraid of ghosts, what are you afraid of? And she's like, well, come look at my apartment. There's something I want you guys to see. And they go back to her apartment and she notices on the floor all the furniture that she's put in. Some of it has shown signs of scratching on the floor repeatedly, like it's been moved. Yeah, right, like it's been shuffled around, and are ghosts doing that? It's probably not ghosts doing that. And she even says, well, even if I wanted to, I can't move this furniture by myself, and I'm looking at some of these entertainment centers and stuff, and I'm. you remember that old entertainment center I used to have? Yeah. That we had to move from one apartment to another, and that couldn't be done without, like, three people? Like, that's the kind of size... Yeah. That's why we abandoned it the second time. Yeah. Forget entertainment centers like that. It's not the 80s anymore. It's not the 90s anymore. You don't need anything that big. Forget it. You don't need an entertainment center that big. But for some reason in the 80s, probably because pieces of entertainment equipment were just fucking enormous at the time. Well, yeah, you needed to have something made out of a tree trunk to be able to support the weight of an 80s TV. A tube TV? Yeah. And a sound system? Are you kidding me? Yeah. You drop one of those on somebody you could kill them. Anyway, there's scratch marks on the floor because this thing has moved. So who the fuck is in here moving this thing? And she explains to Rio, this is why I had a trap set up because I wasn't sure if you were a thief that was trying to get in here. Because I was spooked that somebody was coming in here. I already suspected somebody was coming in here. So I guess it's not you. That's great. However, it's not just when I'm here in my room. It's not just happening in the apartment. I've been feeling like somebody's been watching me and following me back from, like, rehearsals and stuff all the time. Late at night? It's been fucking weird. I always feel like somebody's watching I can't finish that because I don't want to get copyright struck. And <laughs> and Rio's like, oh, so that's why you left an XYZ on the chalkboard at Shinjuku Station. Hey, wait, you went down to Shinjuku Station and you looked at the chalkboard? Anyway. <laughs> yeah, like this all comes up all of a sudden because she's like, oh, so does that mean you're? And he's like, yeah, that's me. I'm City Hunter. And even Cowdy's like, wait, 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 you went to the board without me? And Kaylin and I watching this episode are like, wait, you went to the board at all? We never saw that. Yeah, it's, you know what? You just have to accept that that's the situation that happened off camera. And we just move on with our lives. Now we're here. Sorry. Because it's like, when did she have time to do that in between all of this? Because, like, as far as action is concerned, we are being filled in on a lot of this stuff after the fact. Look, they're just doing what they did in the manga. Literally the exact same thing comes up in the manga. It's... 
It's fine. They're just doing what Tsukasa Hojo wrote. It's okay. Now, admittedly, the way that Kaori and Ryo are interacting with each other in front of Maiko is giving her a bit of pause. As we're talking about this, Kaori's like, well, you can hire Ryo as your bodyguard, because this is what you're talking about needing to do right now. But just realize she reaches into Ryo's pocket and pulls out just this chain of bras. Realize this is the guy you're hiring. Now, if you're okay with that, go for it. And yeah, that is what makes her really concerned. Like, maybe I need to think about this a little while longer before I hire this guy to be my bodyguard because he's a fucking weirdo. And so the next night going into morning, they have this dream sequence play out inside of Maiko's head where she imagines what life would be like if she allowed Ryo and Kaori to stick around. And she wakes up and quite literally the dream plays out in front of her because there's Ryo having broken into the apartment anyway to try and treat her to breakfast. And then Kaori found out that he broke into the apartment, chases him around the apartment with a hammer, and it's just exactly how she dreamed it. And she's like, why am I even scared of my dreams? This is actually what's happening. It's like, no wonder she's dreaming about this shit. Because, like, yeah, this is not a situation that would be ideal. I would not want to be- Of course she's got nightmares! Like, Ryo is just being his absolute worst and giving women nightmares. I mean, that tracks. Yeah. And so she scolds Ryo, like, I haven't even hired hired you. I didn't ask you to come over today. Both of y'all, get out of my apartment. And they kind of walk across the plank back over to Cowdy's. Which, by the way, they have a plank now between her window and Cowrie's window. I mean, lucky them that it's exactly the same height off the ground. Convenient. But unfortunately for Maiko, it's time for her to go to work. And she works, funny enough, at Donald Mag, which, if some of you remember, this is the same Donald Mag. The McDonald's knockoff Donald Mag. Yeah, that shows up in Season 1, Episode 26, What is Love, Ryo's Course and Proper Romance. That's and a very deep callback. And it, it goes further deep. here in a second, because as we see Michael working the counter there, and her co-workers commenting on, Hey, you don't look so good. You doing alright? And she's like, I'm, I'm just dealing with some stuff right now. Alright, this is somebody's order. Somebody from the kitchen, bring it out. And Ryo brings out this order of a burger and some fries and, I don't know, a drink. Oh, it was like a cola. Yeah, it was like a combo. Puts it out on a tray and like, here you go. He's he's working there right now. Yeah, like he's in reason. uniform. And Maiko screams and the manager comes out like, oh no. Rio, have you already gotten started doing some shit again? He's like, I've actually done absolutely nothing. And at the moment, that is true. Although it is fucking weird that he showed up at her job. That is weird. Just that, that is he, weird, Just that yeah. he even showed up there. And she's like, I don't know that I can work with you here. How did you even get this job? And Rio points out, oh, I've been friends with the manager at this particular location for a while. And when he says that, you look up on the wall at these plaques of other managers that have worked there before. And the first plaque you see on the far right is the same manager from season one, episode 26. So they either go through managers or managers come in on different days or whatever. And there's a different manager today, but but like let it be pointed out that that manager in that episode within the first several minutes of that episode is scolding Rio for hitting on the women who work there yeah and you still let him come back well he ended up saving another employee a previous employee at that point in time who wanted to work there and earn money to give her dad a gift and like I he kind of was helpful at that time. I mean, that wasn't a case case like where there was somebody whose life was in danger. That was just a girl who was trying to raise money for her dad. That's not the same thing. Like, so unless he owes, like, the, the branch manager a favor, like, hey, I saved you from the Yakuza or something, I don't know why they would give him deference to acting like he works there. I don't know. Also, on top of that, Rio, you're telling me you could just go work a normal 9 to 5 if you wanted, and you make Cowdy work that night job at the grocery store? Once again, we don't know that's what Cowdy does. Josh has just decided that's what she does. That's my headcanon, yes, uh -huh. and I'm sticking to it. All right. Anyway, it's after work and she's like oh, I gotta get changed I gotta get out of here what a stupid day but she tries to open up her locker in the back room and guess what Rio's in the locker and he's covered in bras and panties uh, you know what I wouldn't do is leave underwear in my work locker even if it's a locker I don't think I would leave that stuff there I mean I it, 
it's a different culture over there. I can't speak to that you know, whether or not yeah, I would. I know. I understand that. I know that that's just not what I would do personally. But see, like you're saying, it does make it worse on Rio when he's already done all this stuff. He snuck into her apartment multiple times. He's basically stalking her at her job. And now he's following her home from work after work well, down a dark, well, dim lit before, road. Before that, though, I just thought it was really funny that, you know, she says she can't move furniture, but she has kicked this entire locker with Rio still in it down the stairs at her job. Kaylin, adrenaline's a hell of a drug. That's true. It's just quite the sight to see and there's like other employees down at the bottom of the stairs like, holy shit, this locker's coming right at us. And then somebody has to mention, oh, Rio's in there. Oh, never mind, he's fine. <laughs> but no, he is following her down this road after work too. And she's already spooked as fuck because somebody has been following her. So of course she thinks, oh, well, it's just been you this whole time, hasn't it? Like, you've just been trying to talk to me this whole time, and now you've just got the guts to actually try to approach me, and you're being a fucking weirdo. Well, specifically, she, she calls him a pervert. Sure. And he's like, no, it ain't like that, I well, promise. Well, like, he I, is being a pervert, but it hasn't... I mean, like, I am, but it's not not today. That's not that's not what this is about. Not, not before today. Not before today. No, you're right. And so she just kind of leaves his ass there on one street and then goes down another one just to try and get away from him but still make it home which kind of does and doesn't make sense because it's not like she can get away from him that much because she knows he lives next door yeah like what good is that gonna do yeah, she even says man if it weren't for the fact that this apartment was so cheap and you know i don't really have any other money i would move again i would do it i would move again and no sooner has she gone down this other street that she hears footsteps again not dun, 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 not those footsteps no like actual uh footfalls clip clop clip clop and she's like, oh, Rio, you better not be following me again. Uh, and it's not. It's just some other really big guy. And he's getting closer. And, and he's, he's wearing pantyhose over his head. Like a mugger. Yeah. And so she's trying to haul ass to get away from him. Unfortunately, dude catches up and has one of those rags that's like, hey, does this smell like chloroform to you? And tries to chloroform the fuck out of her and make her pass out so he can kidnap her. But Rio is there and he's got a trash can lid. And he very much uses it like Captain America's shield and just throws it across down the street, hits the guy in the face, and the shield, I call it a shield because it's just so much like a shield. No, the trash can lid just comes right back to his hand. Yeah, he Captain america his ass. It's pretty good, actually. And so dude in the pantyhose tries making a break for it. Rio's like, come back here, you. And before he can take off, Maiko's grabbing onto Rio's leg for dear luck. Like, oh my God, I'm so scared. Don't leave me here. Don't leave me here. I take it all back. Please, I'll hire you. Just don't leave me alone. I don't want to be alone. You know, she's scared out of her mind right now. Mm -hmm. She was already freaked out by everything Rio was doing. And now she's actually been accosted by the dude who's trying to do something to her. So she's like, okay, I... I was accusing you of stuff, and you are kind of fucking weird, but, I mean, would it be weird if I asked you to go ahead and be my bodyguard, because now we know that this is happening? And Riel's like, no, actually, I'd be thrilled about that. And she just responds with, like, that's great, but I've got to ask, why are you touching my butt? Why are you doing that? And we look, and yeah, sure enough, he's just, he's just rubbing away. Which is, it's funny, because I look into the manga, and it's different, but I understand why it's different in the anime here because when she's saying okay please protect me but I gotta ask why you got all my bras in your pocket so this is the second time he's done that in the manga but then in the bottom left hand corner there is a self caricature of Tsukasa Hojo the manga author and artist just kind of stressed out and he's like what do you think was it okay that I had him do this twice L like he's sweating over here he's clearly like man Man, I'm just stressed out and I'm pressed for time and I couldn't think of something else to do right now. I couldn't think of other business to give Rio, so I just had him do the same thing twice. So even he is, realizes, shit, I made him do this twice, but I've got to get this to print, like, yeah. right now. So I understand, okay, so Sunrise was like, well, let's just make him do different business. On the same level, but different. Right. Now he's just a butt toucher. So. Yeah, now, now it's this. But, but fine. Now you would think that Rio would decide that, oh, actually, after she's been assaulted here on the street by some big burly guy that's about Umibozu's size, I would back off the next day. You know, make her feel safe. Or what I could do... 
<laughs> hear me out, me. I could double down and do the same shit I did at the beginning of the episode and sneak in Spider-Man style through the skylight and try and jump her in bed. So he does that. He does that. And then he, he jumps at the bed at the body that is lying in the bed like I'm, I'm gonna get her and then it turns out there's a hammer there and it's got that comedy crow on it and it says a whole you know it's calling him a dumbass yeah you know it's Cowrie in bed it is not Maiko in that bed and he's like damn it it's you Cowrie then where's Maiko oh she's in my room hi Rio she's waving at him from across the street <laughs> in Cowrie's window and Rio's just like she was in the building with me the whole time damn and see i had to go through this cycle in my head real quick of like cowdy you just said at the beginning of the episode like the least you could have done was do something with me and he was about to do something why didn't you just let him but then i realized no because if he you let him do that right now that would give him the impression it's okay to assault and you don't want it to be assault you want it to be consensual but then why was she about to let him at the beginning of the episode if that was what he was going to do? I don't know. See, I, I'm confused here. I don't know what she wants, Josh. She wants justice, Kalen. Um, I'm not sure about that, actually. And again, they're back eating breakfast over in Cowdy and Rio's, and they're talking about, well, what do you got to do today, Maiko? Like, what, what's on the agenda? And she's like, well, today I have a real big audition over at the Toto Theater. I got to go take care of that. This is a big show. They're only letting in one female and one male cast member that they're auditioning for. So I got to get in there and see if I can get in. And immediately Rio's like, all right, I'll join too. I'll I'll try and get in this show. And everybody, like, they're both like, why would you do that? You're not a dancer. You can't dance. You can't audition for this. And Rio's like, no, nah, it'll be fine. What if I just put on one of Maiko's leotards? That'll do it. That's all I need to do is wear one of hers. Kaori's like, you can't be wearing her clothes. That's not for you to wear. Yeah, the cut's completely different, bro. You don't, you don't want to do that. That. Which has now left a pair of underwear in his hand that was just kind of sitting there with that leotard. Like she had it ready for the day. Right. And it happens to be a thong, a G-string basically. Which makes sense if you dance because you don't want lines in your costume. And they bring that up here in a second. Like, yeah, you wear these to avoid panty lines while you're dancing. And Rio's like, oh my god, you wear stuff like this? You just wear these naughty pairs of underwear? Because he has not gotten the under understanding that there is a reason why a dancer might want them. Right, exactly. And so in the manga, he's just hit with a hammer for even talking about this, right? What's really interesting is in the anime, Kaori hits him with a completely different kind of stone. What is it the subtitles say? So the, the subtitles, subtitles say, here, it's this giant, like, bathtub-sized weight with a chain on it that Kaori seems to be, like, riding down on top of Ryo. And the subtitle they go with says... Cowrie's weight. Weight as in... Uh, a unit not, of measurement. A unit room. of measurement. Or, or this is a weight. Yeah. This is something that you lift, not necessarily calories weight of 80 pounds or however much she weighs right yeah. just that this belongs to kauri and i'm looking at it and i'm like that's not the kanji for her name but maybe there's a rationalization for this translation they have chosen right and i'm i'm looking up the kanji that's written on it and it's literally ningen tsukemono okay which is person vegetables very literally right and so i'm looking up tsukemono why are we talking about vegetables right now let me see if there's a reason why that would be used on like a, a giant weight and I'm looking around and apparently there's something called it tsukemono ishi so tsukemono ishi is like a vegetable stone you use this during the pickling process and tsukemono is pickled vegetables right it's right. specifically pickled vegetables and ishi is stone and ishi is stone or rock yeah so it's a stone that like I'm looking at pictures of it it's a stone that you put onto these vegetables during the pickling process and you're pressing them down and they've got a string or a rope coming out of the top of it that when you're done with it you, you, you pull lift, it back up yeah you lift the stone with this rope and i'm looking at what Kauri is using in the anime and like she's got the chain on the top of it that could be the only thing that could lift this stone again right right so this is a stone that is pickle pressing people so to me if you're gonna adapt that calling it like a human press 
would be a little more accurate than saying maybe. Cowdy's weight. Maybe, because yeah. Because I, we kind of get how you got there, but kind of like you said, it's just the side of hella inaccurate. It's pretty close to not really explaining what the fuck this thing actually is. Unless you understand that during the process of pickling vegetables in Japan, you use a stone that looks like this, I guess Americans just wouldn't know. Because I had to look it up. I didn't know what this device was. Right. You know? I understood what pickled vegetables were, and I understood the kanji for people, but, like, I didn't know what a pickled vegetable stone was. Right. Uh, specifically. So, yeah, you had you would have to know all of this in order to properly get across to your audience. This is what Kauri has just hit him with. Specifically, she's trying to press him like you would food. She's trying to food process his ass. In its own <laughs> way, that's like an extra layer of funny. Of, right. Like, it's not just that she hit him with just an enormous weight. It's that it's used in the process of making food. She doesn't think of him as anything higher than just being a piece of food. Right, exactly. And after that is all dealt with, they go ahead and go down with Maiko down to the Toto Theater, where all of these people are gathered up on stage. And this is one of those big cattle calls you can see. The closest approximation I have to it, or not even approximation, that's what it was, is uh, if you've ever seen that documentary, uh, Michael Jackson, This Is It, the very beginning of that movie mm -hmm. is something like this, a dance audition. You've got the director, the casting people, the producers involved, the people who are making the decisions, and then you're all on stage dancing for them to see who gets parts. Mm -hmm. And Michael explains, look, the only people that can be here today are auditioners or people who are actually working on the show. So what the hell are you two guys still even doing here? And Ryo explains, no, I'm, I'm here to audition. I put my name in. Well, what about you, Kauri? And she's like, oh, I do jazzercise. I'm good. I'm going to audition. <laughs> well, that, yeah, that'll do it. Jazzercise and aerobics. Yeah, that's which what I'm saying. We have seen Cowdy do before here on the show. Aerobics is not going to cut it for what they're trying. Because Maiko is explaining, oh, all these people eventually want to go do Broadway. And Kauri, you're here because you've done aerobic dance. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. Like, wh no. Cowdy, what do you think you're doing here? Do you think you're auditioning for Vicha? What is this? <laughs> that is so mean. <laughs> well, it's the idea of this is all I've done so I can audition for the national stage, right? Yeah. This is a very specific thing you would have to look at. Oh, God. This, this is related. We don't have to explain it. This we don't related have to, to K-pop. That's, that's the only hint I'm going to give you. <laughs> <laughs> Point being, they go ahead and say, all right, we're going to give you guys numbers, and we're going to call you up by number, and that's the order you're going to audition in. We're going to do the men first. So number one for the men, go ahead and get up here. The rest of you women, go ahead and get changed. And sure enough, number one happens to be Rio. Rio is going to set this bar on the floor. <laughs> Rio's like, oh no, I'm ready for this. And he disrobes. But, but Josh, you remember doing, Texas has a, a set of school competitions called UIL for various yeah. things. Right? You remember doing UIL for like choir or whatever, and I did right? choir and theater. And, and yeah. I also did choir, right? So you know what that's like when like, you just pray you're not contestant number one. No, right? see, like, it depended on, quite honestly, it had a lot to do with confidence because it can go one of two ways. The predominant way everybody takes it is you don't want to be the first person because first up is first forgotten. Right. And also, there's tremendous pressure on whoever goes first to set the tone and the pace for everybody else. Yes. And most people in high school don't have the capacity or the self-confidence to be able to be like, I'm ready to be number one. Follow that. One year, one year, my choir ended up being first up. And my conductor was stressed. He was so upset. But it, it turned out we knocked it out of the fucking park. You have to do so well that nobody for the whole rest of the day will be able to follow you. Here comes Rio. Okay, on this stage, he's number one. And everybody's looking at him like, wow, actually, he's super muscular. Like, he's got the body of somebody who could be a dancer, but Cowrie's got this look on her face like, well, I've never seen him do it, but he has done some wild shit. And we've seen him do things like do sit-ups off the side of a building while grabbing the side of the building with his toes. So I don't know. And we talked like about it here on the podcast before about how Rio does have to have some kind of crazy regimen 
Freeman to keep up his agility, his strength, his flexibility, all of these things. So technically speaking, he does have some of what he needs to be some kind of dancer. And so to begin, you know, he, he slates for the audience, you know, for the director out there in the audience. Number one, Saibo Ryo. All right, here I go. And he like Tokusatsu jumps tall. And he gets massive height. And at first, everybody's real impressed. Like, wow, this guy can jump. Look at his vertical. And he's he's a little too vertical. He's, he's too good. He's, he's too good. He's so he's like inhuman good to the point where he will never be a dancer because he is stuck in the lights and the rigging and the wires of, of all of the spotlights and stuff for this stage. And he's immediately told to get the fuck out. Even though, like, I don't know how he's going to do that. He's caught in the wires right now. Which, if you've ever been in theater, one, that doesn't ever really happen. No. This is This is a cartoon. But no. two... Even if you thought somebody was going to get anywhere close to the rigging, the techies would have that on lockdown. Yeah, yeah, And yeah, you wouldn't yeah. be able to touch that. And that's true no matter where you go to do theater. But Rio is not going to pass up this opportunity while he's here in this theater. Like, oh, all the men are out on stage? Well, that means all the women are in the changing rooms. I gotta go see butts. Chicks. I gotta go check out chicks. That's what I'm gonna do. <laughs> and Cowdy was ready for his ass. She's got the Tenchu, the Divine Punishment Hammer ready. But she does this thing, and I know, I know it's only because the writing says it so. But you would think after about the third or fourth time of her doing this, she would learn not to do it like this. She hits him into the room where all the yeah, women are changing. She should have swung in the other direction. Right, exactly. And I, I kind of want to point out here, like, yes, the women are all changing and they're all freaked the fuck out, right? In the anime, they're wearing fairly normal underwear, even though Ryo is positive, like, wait, all these women are going to be wearing these string thongs, right? And all the butts in the anime are, like, fully covered ass cheeks, for the most part. They're wearing, like, bear print and floral print and hearts on them. But, no, no, the manga definitely puts them in string thongs. These these are just asses out kind of bikini underwear. Which would yeah. be actually more accurate. It would be. And I just think they made an alteration for the sake of television. Otherwise, like, it's not a big deal. It's definitely butts. And it's definitely women changing. And Ryo has definitely scared the ever-loving shit out of these poor women. He's definitely sexually harassing a shit ton of women. And chasing well, them out into the hallway. <laughs> and he's being chased by Cowdy, and they are just running amok across this entire stage, knocking shit over, breaking things, blowing out lights. They have literally wrecked the entire set for this production. And so, what the director has decided is the correct answer is, I can't believe you've done this, so come back tomorrow when you're gonna clean everything up and you're gonna do it for free, and I will not pay you. This is now indentured servitude. I would immediately just be like, I am calling the police. You're never to come back onto the premises. Yeah, yeah, like, you would think you would like, just kick them out. But no, he invites them back for free. And I understand that it's it's work and that this is technically unpaid labor, which is very probably illegal. And Rio's like, well, it works for us because then that means we have a reason to be here and keep an eye on Michael just in case that dude shows up again. <laughs> It's great that it worked out that way, but also, what the fuck? There's also, dun, 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 that's it. That's the end of the up. It ends right there. Right. And it's, to me, it's one of the most abrupt endings we've ever come into. Because they're kind of still in mid-conversation while yeah. the music comes in. They were just like, oh my god, we ran out of time. Oh god. Like, <laughs> this is literally like any award ceremony of somebody giving their speech, and then they're being played off stage. Like, they are mid-scene, like, you guys are gonna have to come in tomorrow da, 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 and you're gonna have to work for free da, 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 and i'm gonna oh yeah thanks to the producers da, da, thanks to sukasa hojo da, 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 thanks to sunrise da, da, thank you guys love you da, 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 da. yeah and that's how that works and that's <laughs> part one of this two-parter yep this goes on for a while flipping through the mind i think the whole rest of this book i've got in my hands right now is okay no it's almost the whole rest of the book is this story. Yeah, because I think this last part you've got here this is very we've already covered that in a different episode. Yes. Okay. So, yeah. And, yeah, you're right. It, this is some of the most egregious behavior we've seen out of Rio in a while. It's pretty bad. I'm not going to lie. And I get, like, for the time period, it's, it's funny in context. And then you have modern context where it's like, no, you should just leave women alone. Just... <laughs> 
maybe don't frighten women for no reason? Can like, you please stop doing that? Just don't do that. Just don't. Like don't <laughs> don't don't show up unannounced. Don't sneak into windows. Don't creep around at the job and wait for somebody to leave. And if another thing that I didn't mention out of the manga is while he's at the job, like there's a peephole into the dressing no, room. No, no, no. We've had too many peephole problems here on the show. Yeah, he peeps in and then actually Calorie's there and she shoots her gun at Rio and it grazes the top of his head and shaves him right down the middle. So Well, I'm glad we avoided that. Just the whole situation. I mean. Yeah, I just think the only reason they didn't do that was to save time. Literally, that's the only reason why it's not there. Well, yeah, because they obviously ran out of time this week. But, but, like, he could have perved more, Josh. If they had more time, they could have let him do this more. Well, then we're lucky. We are fortunate. <laughs> Maiko's fortunate. And hopefully we're fortunate enough to have you guys come back and listen to more of this next episode and hopefully uh that will actually be next week and we will not run into any problems doing this again please let's just fix the rest of this year we're working on it all right so come back next time when we cover the 57th episode of city hunter 2 success story in shinjuku the neighbor is a beautiful dancer part two and if you want to catch us outside this podcast you can always find us both over on most social media i'm at josh knight first and i'm at mars girl thank you all so much for listening to our 107th episode of mokori play and if you don't come back next episode, Josh is going to miss a curtain call. I have never once missed curtain call in my entire career. Well, it's happening now. Stop it.